Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, I am Dr. Shubha, Professor of Anatomy from Kempegoda Institute of Medical Sciences, Bangalore. Today we are continuing with our topic of mediastinum. So this is mediastinum part 2. A patient was admitted with filariasis and his chest x-ray showed this picture and the students were wondering why was this cardiac enlargement present in case of filariasis? Then the consultant told, let us look at the structures which are present in relation to the heart which can get affected in filariasis. So today's lecture is going to be under these headings. We are going to define what is mediastinum, what are the subdivisions of mediastinum, we will talk about the inferior mediastinum subdivisions, the anterior mediastinum the boundaries and contents, the middle mediastinum boundaries and contents and similarly the posterior mediastinum boundaries and contents. We will be talking about in detail about some of the structures which are present here that will be the pulmonary trunk, the esophagus, the thoracic duct azygous venous system, the thoracic sympathetic trunk and we will conclude this by summarizing the topic. We already know mediastinum is the middle septum which is present in the thoracic cavity. It is bounded on either side by the mediastinal pleura. We have seen an imaginary plane which is going to divide this mediastinum into an upper half which is called as superior mediastinum and a lower half which will be called as inferior mediastinum. The inferior mediastinum has the heart and the pericardium present in it and this heart and pericardium is going to divide the inferior mediastinum into anterior, a middle and posterior mediastinum. Now let us look at the boundaries of anterior mediastinum. Anterior mediastinum is bounded anteriorly by this bone which is present, this is the sternum. So it is bounded anteriorly by the body of sternum, posteriorly by the pericardium and the heart and on either side it is bounded by the mediastinal pleura. When we look at the contents of this anterior mediastinum which is in front of the pericardium behind the sternum, you will find a remnant of thymus can be found in case of adults sometimes as a small fat mass. This thymus is a bilobed structure. It is Larger in case of children keeps increasing in size up to the puberty and then it starts undergoing involution. So in case of adults you find occasionally remnants of thymus. It is an important organ because it produces thymosin which helps in bringing about immunity. We also find certain arteries which are present here, they are the branches, mediastinal branches coming from the surrounding arteries like the internal mammary or the thoracic artery. We also find certain ligaments attaching the pericardium to the sternum, these are called as sternopericardial ligaments. There are two sternopericardial ligaments, a superior sternopericardial and an inferior sternopericardial ligament. The middle mediastinum is bounded by the pericardium and its contents. So you find in the middle mediastinum the heart and the pericardium along with the ascending aorta, the pulmonary trunk, 
proximal half of superior vena cava or the lower end of the superior vena cava that is intrapericardial part. Just before it becomes intrapericardial, it receives arch of azygous vein. So, this is not a content of middle mediastinum. Middle mediastinum is also associated with the phrenic nerve and the accompanying pericardiacophrenic vessels. Phrenic nerve and pericardiacophrenic vessels are going to supply the diaphragm along with the pericardium in case of the vessels. Now, let us look at the boundaries of the posterior mediastinum. It is bounded anteriorly by the bifurcation of the trachea. You find the pulmonary vessels, the sloping heart and the pericardium posterior surface along with the sloping posterior surface of the diaphragm. These structures form the anterior boundary for the posterior mediastinum. So, from above downwards, you find the tracheal bifurcation, the pulmonary vessels, posterior surface of the heart and the pericardium and the posterior sloping surface of the diaphragm. Posteriorly, it is bounded by the thoracic vertebrae that will be the T5 to T12 thoracic vertebrae with the intervening intervertebral discs. On either side, it is bounded by the mediastinal pleura. Now, let us look at the contents of the posterior mediastinum. Posterior mediastinum has the esophagus with the uh, vagus nerves. The vagus nerves form a plexus around the esophagus. As they go towards the diaphragm, they are going to form the anterior po and posterior vagal trunks, which will continue as the gastric nerves. You also find the azygous vein in the posterior mediastinum. Correspondingly, on the opposite side, you will find the hemiazygous venous system, the superior and inferior hemiazygous veins, which are tributaries to the azygous vein itself. You find the sympathetic trunk slightly lateral to the midline, giving its branches, which will be encountered in the posterior mediastinum and also the descending thoracic iota, the most important content of posterior mediastinum. When we look at a diagrammatic representation of the same, you can see the esophagus in the posterior mediastinum. It is present on the posterior aspect, just in the prevertebral region, but later as it descends down, it comes to lie anterior to the descending thoracic iota. The two are separated by a pleural recess. The next content is the azygous vein, which sli slightly lies on the right side of the midline. It is to the right of the iota, separated from the iota by the thoracic duct, which is the continuation of the cisterna chylae. And you find the descending thoracic iota itself slightly to the left of the midline. Posterior to the iota and the thoracic duct, you find the hemiazygous veins running across the midline and ending in the azygous venous system. Coming to the pulmonary trunk, pulmonary trunk takes its origin from the right ventricle. It is the continuation of the infundibulum of the right ventricle, which is the outflow tract, which continues as the pulmonary trunk. It is a short vessel about 3 to 5 centimeters in length. It terminates by dividing into right and left pulmonary arteries. Initially, it is anterior to the ascending iota. Then it comes to lie on the left side of the ascending iota. It terminates into right and left pulmonary arteries. The right pulmonary artery will pass behind the ascending iota and the superior vena cava to reach the hilum of the right lung. Whereas the left pulmonary artery will cross in front of the arch of iota to reach the hilum of the left lung. The proximal portion of the left pulmonary artery is connected to the iota by a ligament which is called as ligamentum arteriosum, which is a remnant of the ductus arteriosus. So, this is the pulmonary trunk and this is the ascending iota. This is the arch of iota. Trachea lies above the pulmonary trunk. 
and the pulmonary trunk is connected by ductus arteriosus in the fetal life which becomes ligamentum arteriosum in the adult life with the arch of aorta. So, the proximal portion of the left pulmonary artery is connected to the arch of aorta distal to the origin of left subclavian artery by a ligament which is called as ligamentum arteriosum. This is hooked by the left recurrent laryngeal nerve which is a branch coming from the left vagus. Medial to the ligamentum arteriosum is the superficial cardiac plexus, very close to the ligament within this plexus lies the cardiac ganglion of Risberg. The ligamentum arteriosum is a remnant of the ductus arteriosus which is seen in fetal life. The function of this ductus arteriosus is to bypass the blood from the pulmonary trunk which is carrying it from the right ventricle, bypass the blood in the pulmonary circulation, it goes directly to the aorta. So, once the aorta receives the blood, it will be distributed to the whole of the body. This is in case of fetal life. So, ligamentum arteriosum is a remnant of this duct which is the ductus arteriosus in case of adults because it undergoes involution after birth. What happens is immediately after birth the ductus arteriosus will have a negative balance of pressure because there is pulmonary circulation developing now. The lungs become active. So, you find the blood passing through the pulmonary arteries entering the lung undergoing the pulmonary circulation and the blood comes back to the heart on the left side and reaches the aorta. So, slowly the ductus arteriosus involutes and results in the formation of ligamentum arteriosum. The functional non-existence of the ductus happens within one week itself because it loses its importance whereas the structural involution takes time. It takes place within 4 to 12 weeks of time. Then it gets converted into ligamentum arteriosum. Occasionally you find the ductus remains even in adults then it is called as patent ductus arteriosus. What does it do? It brings the blood from the aorta into the left pulmonary artery thereby causing an overload on the pulmonary circulation with this an increase in the pressure, backward pressure on the right ventricle resulting in right ventricular hypertrophy. This overload can result in congestive cardiac failure and there can be decreased oxygenated blood reaching the extremities resulting in cyanosis that is blueing of the periphery. Pulmonary artery catheterization can be done to monitor cardiopulmonary functions. So, it can be catheterized. Sudden occlusion of pulmonary trunk in case of deep vein thrombosis especially when a person is bedridden post surgery or post complications if it, they are bedridden for a longer duration it can result in deep vein thrombosis. Dislodgement of the thrombus can result in thromb thromboembolism of the pulmonary artery. It results in hemoptysis coughing out of blood. Coming to the esophagus, esophagus is a muscular tube which is the foot pipe of the body. It is going to carry the foot bolus. We can see the esophagus starts off at the level of the sixth cervical vertebra where it is there is a junction between the pharynx and the esophagus. This pharyngoesophageal junction at the level of lower border of the sixth cervical vertebra is the narrowest part of the esophagus and it is the second narrowest part of the gastrointestinal tract next in line to the appendix. Here you find a constrictor which is present that is the cricopharyngeus. It is the part of the inferior constrictor of pharynx. It has got circular muscle fibers and it acts as a constrictor, cricopharyngeus. From the pharyngoesophageal junction at the level of the sixth cervical vertebra lower border, you find the esophagus descending down in the superior mediastinum and the posterior mediastinum 
as a pre-vertebral structure. Initially, it is in the midline, then it deviates to the left. The convexity is also seen to the left in the upper part, very close to its origin. You find the esophagus deviates slightly to the left and much more towards its termination where it ends by joining the stomach. And this happens within the abdomen because esophagus passes through the diaphragm, through the esophageal opening of the diaphragm which is at the level of the 10th thoracic vertebra and ends near the car cardiac orifice of the stomach. This is at the level of the 11th thoracic vertebra. So the whole of the esophagus extends from the lower border of C6 to the lower border of T11 vertebra. It measures about 25 centimeters in length. If you can recall, there are other structures which measure 25 centimeters in length. One of them is ureter, which is also 25 centimeters in length, and the other one is the duodenum, which is also 25 centimeters in length. So, these are the three structures which have a length of about 25 centimeters. When we look at the esophagus, it is related to trachea in the front in the superior mediastinum because trachea is going to bifurcate at the level of the fourth thoracic vertebra. Then you find the arch of aorta crosses the esophagus and the trachea and the lower end of the arch comes to lie to the left of the esophagus and this continues down as the descending thoracic aorta which is on the left side of the esophagus and later it lies posterior to the esophagus. The two structures esophagus and the descending thoracic aorta in the lower part of the posterior mediastinum are separated from each other by a mesoesophagus. It is the pleural recess which lies or connects the two sides pleural cavities close to each other between the aorta and the esophagus. It is called as mesoesophagus. You also find thoracic duct lying la to the right side of the esophagus in the lower part. At the level of the fourth thoracic vertebra, it is going to cross posterior to the esophagus and it then it comes to lie on the left side of the esophagus in the superior mediastinum. Esophagus shows certain constrictions. The narrowest portion of the esophagus as we have told already is the pharyngoesophageal junction. This is at the level of the 6th cervical vertebra and this is due to presence of cricopharyngeus which has got circular muscle fibers. This is approximately 6 inches from the central incisor teeth. The next constriction which you see on the esophagus is due to crossing of the arch of aorta. This happens at the level of the fourth thoracic vertebra. It is about 9 inches from the central incisor teeth. The next constriction of the esophagus is due to the left principal bronchus. This happens at the level of the sixth thoracic vertebra. It is about 11 inches from the central incisor teeth. The last constriction of the esophagus is at the level of the 10th thoracic vertebra. This is due to passing of the esophagus through the diaphragm through the esophageal aperture. It is about 15 inches from the incisor teeth. Beyond this, you find about 1 inch of esophagus, about 2.5 centimeters, which is abdominal part of the esophagus. This ends at the 11th thoracic vertebra where you find the cardioesophageal junction. Let us look at the blood supply of the esophagus. Blood supply indicates it has both arterial and venous. So, looking at the arterial supply, it is supplied by inferior thyroid artery branches in the neck. Branches of thoracic aorta and the bronchial arteries supply it in the posterior mediastinum and the left gastric and the inferior phrenic will supply it in the abdominal cavity. When you look at the venous drainage, you find the inferior thyroid veins drain the cervical part of the esophagus. They carry to the internal thoracic vein. 
the azygous and the hemiazygous systems will drain the thoracic part of the esophagus. They will be ending in superior vena cava either directly as azygous or indirectly uh, hemiazygous through the azygous. You also find the lower part of the esophagus, there is communication between hemiazygous and the left gastric veins. Hemiazygous is a tributary of superior vena cava, whereas the left gastric is a tributary of the portal venous system. So, you find these veins become important because in case of portosystemic anastomosis, these veins can get engorged resulting in esophageal varices. Now, let us look at the nerve supply of the esophagus. Nerve supply will include both parasympathetic and sympathetic. So, parasympathetic nerves supplying esophagus come via the vagus or its branch that is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. These nerves that is the parasympathetic nerves will be supplying sensory, motor and secretomotor nerve supply. It is sensory to the mucosa of the esophagus motor to the musculature of the esophagus and secretomotor to the glands. The sympathetic supply is from T5 to T9 branches, they are both sensory and vasomotor. They bring about contraction of the smooth muscle in the walls of the vessels supplying the esophagus. Referred pain is carried via the sympathetic either T4 or T5 spinal segments and this can mimic anginal pain. Now, let us look at the lymphatic drainage of the esophagus. The cervical part of the esophagus drains into deep cervical lymph nodes, the thoracic part into the posterior mediastinal lymph nodes and lastly the abdominal part drains into the left gastric lymph nodes. Here is a dissected specimen showing the esophagus. You can see this is the arch of iota with its branches. This is the trachea. Here is the superior vena cava and this is the esophagus. Between the trachea and the esophagus, you can see this structure lying there. That is the tracheoesophageal groove containing the recurrent laryngeal nerve of the left side. Now, let us look at the clinical anatomy of esophagus. Esophageal dilatation due to neuromuscular incoordination where the cardioesophageal junction does not open up when there is a foot bolus coming towards the lower end of the esophagus results in dilatation of the esophagus and this condition is called as achalasia cardia. A neuromuscular incoordination resulting in esophageal dilatation, achalasia cardia. The next clinical aspect which you can see is tracheoesophageal fistula. There is a disrupted development of tracheoesophageal septum which is going to divide the trachea and the esophagus completely. So, you find part of the esophagus is a blind ending tube whereas the lower part of it becomes connected to the trachea itself resulting in a fistula. This is called as tracheoesophageal fistula. Portal hypertension can result in varices in the lower part of the esophagus. This is due to communication between the systemic and the portal veins. The systemic vein draining here is the azygous venous system, tributaries of the azygous venous system, whereas the portal system is part of the gastric veins which ends in the portal vein. So, you find the engorgement of these veins which are communicating with the azygous system above and the portal system below results in esophageal varices, varicosity of the esophageal veins. This results in rupture and bleed. This can be detected by doing a barium swallow where it appears worm like in the interior. It can also be detected by esophagoscopy which is a fiber optic scope which is used to look at the interior of the esophagus. Now, coming on to the thoracic duct, it is a major lymphatic duct of the body. This thoracic duct is the continuation of the cisterna chylae which is present in the lumbar region of the abdomen in the midline in front of the lumbar vertebra. You find this thoracic duct ascending up entering the thoracic cavity through the 
aperture for the iota that is the aortic aperture behind the median arcate ligament. So, you find this thoracic duct ascends up in the midline between the azygous vein on the right side and the descending thoracic iota on the left side. It ascends up to reach the fifth thoracic vertebra where it crosses to the left side behind all the structures present here, runs on the left side of the vertebral column to reach the neck. In the neck, it is going to form a loop by arching over and it is going to end at the junction of the internal jugular with the subclavian of the left side forming the left brachiocephalic vein. So, you can see the cisterna chyli highlighted, the descending thoracic iota which is on the left side of the thoracic duct, the azygous vein which is on the right side of the thoracic duct, the esophagus which will be in front of the thoracic duct because the crossing takes place just next to the vertebral column. This is the left brachiocephalic vein formation where the thoracic duct is going to end in. So, this shows the area of drainage of the thoracic duct. So, except for this area that is the right half of the thoracic cage or the cavity, the right upper limb, the right half of the neck and the right half of the face. Except for this area, the rest of the body is drained by thoracic duct. It receives bronchomediastinal lymph trunk from the thoracic cage and the intercostal space and the mediastinum. It also receives left subclavian lymph trunk from the upper limb. It receives the left jugular lymph trunk from the left half of the head and neck. All these will end in the thoracic duct and the thoracic duct itself ends in the junction of the left subclavian and the left jugular vein forming the brachiocephalic vein. So, it is going to end into the formation of the left brachiocephalic vein. Similarly, on the opposite side, instead of thoracic duct, you find the right lymphatic duct which is going to receive the right bronchomediastinal lymph trunk, the right subclavian lymph trunk and the right jugular lymph trunk. All of them will join together to form the right lymphatic duct which is going to end in the junction between the right subclavian and the right brachiocephalic vein formation. This is a dissected specimen showing the thoracic duct. You can appreciate the beaded appearance of the thoracic duct. This is due to the presence of a number of valves in the thoracic duct. So, it gives rise to a beaded appearance. Coming to the clinical anatomy of thoracic duct, injury of the thoracic duct, what does it contain? It contains chyle which is a product of fat digestion. So, this milk like substance will pour out into the thoracic cavity forming what is called as chylothorax. If this is untreated, then it can track out communicating with the exterior forming a fistula. This will be chylus fistula. Obstruction of the thoracic duct can happen in case of filariasis. So, if you recall the first few slides where we discussed about the case in the hospital where a filariasis patient had enlargement of the cardiac shadow region in the x-ray that is the reason given here now because this patient can have obstruction of the thoracic duct which can result in chylothorax the lymph entering into the thoracic cavity or into the uh, pleural cavity itself or it can pour into the peritoneum or it can appear in the urine or it can enter the tunica vaginalis of the testis forming chylocele. Coming to the azygous venous system, azygous venous system is the venous system of the thoracic cavity where you find the veins of the thoracic cage will be ending in the superior vena cava through the azygous venous system. Azygous means unpaired. It is present on the right side of the midline in the prevertebral region. This azygous vein starts off in the abdominal cavity as the union of right subcostal vein, right lumbar azygous and right ascending lumbar vein. The lumbar azygous vein will communicate the azygous vein with the inferior vena cava because it is going to 
connect to the inferior vena cava, the lumbar ascites. Occasionally, you find the right subcostal and the lumbar ascites itself forming the ascites vein without a contribution of the right ascending lumbar vein. The ascites vein runs on the right side of the midline to reach up the uh, up to the fourth thoracic vertebral level. The, here, it is going to arch over the root of the right lung and it is going to end in the superior vena cava before it pierces the pericardium. So, that is the azygous vein course. Coming to the tributaries of the azygous vein, you find the formative tributaries and you also find these veins draining into the azygous venous system. This one we have already mentioned, it is the superior intercostal vein. It is the union of the second, third and the fourth veins together forming the superior intercostal vein. It ends in the azygous vein. The remaining intercostal veins are going to end in the azygous vein and you find the first superior intercostal vein, sorry first posterior intercostal vein will end in the right brachiocephalic or the left brachiocephalic corresponding to the side. The superior intercostal vein which is the union of the second, third and fourth is going to end in the arch of azygous on the right side whereas on the left side it is going to end in the left brachiocephalic vein itself. So, this is one of the differences between the right and the left sides in relation to the venous system. The azygous vein before it pierces the pericardium you find the superior vena cava will receive of the azygous vein. So, it is extra pericardial tributary to superior vena cava. The azygous vein is receiving the other two tributaries here that will be the hemiazygous and that is the hemiazygous or the inferior hemiazygous and the superior hemiazygous or the accessory hemiazygous vein. So, they cross the midline posterior to all the structures and end in the azygous vein. This happens at the level of the 8th thoracic vertebra. On the opposite side of the az azygous vein, you find the hemiazygous venous system. The corresponding to the azygous vein in the lower part what you see is called as hemiazygous vein. So, it can also take its origin similar to azygous from the right subcostal lumbar azygous on the left side it will be the left ascending lumbar vein. So, these will unite to form the hemiazygous vein. This will pierce the left crust. The azygous vein enters through the aortic aperture whereas the hemiazygous vein will pierce the left crust, enter the thoracic cage, it is going to receive the 9th, 10th and the 11th posterior intercostal veins and it is going to cross the midline and end in the azygous vein opposite to T8. Similarly, the accessory hemiazygous vein will start off in the medial end of the 5th intercostal space by receiving the 5th posterior intercostal vein. It descends down and keeps accumulating the posterior intercostal veins uh, by collecting the 6th, 7th, 8th posterior intercostal veins, it is going to cross the midline at the level of the 8th thoracic vertebra and end in the azygous vein. So, it starts from the 5th vertebral level ends at the 8th vertebral level, tributaries being 5th to 8th posterior intercostal veins. The crossing of azygous uh, superior and inferior hemiazygous veins is posterior to the esophagus and the descending thoracic aorta in front of the vertebra, especially the T8 vertebra. You can see the azygous vein here. This is the azygous vein in a dissected specimen. This is the abdominal aorta. So, it will be on the right side of the azygous venous system will be on the right side of the midline. On the left side of the midline is the descending thoracic aorta. Coming to the clinical anatomy of azygous vein, it is the main collateral channel between the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. Because of this communication, azygous veins can be enlarged along with the posterior intercostal veins in case of obstruction of superior or inferior vena cava. If posterior intercostal veins are enlarged, it results in notching of the ribs. Next, coming on to the thoracic sympathetic chain, this is a ganglionated nerve trunk present on either side of the midline. It has a cervical part, thoracic part, lumbar and sacral part. The cervical part has got three ganglia, whereas the thoracic part will have the 12 thoracic ganglia corresponding to the 12 thoracic spinal nerves. 
occasionally the first ganglia, the thoracic ganglia will unite with the lowermost cervical sympathetic ganglia. Together they form what is called as cervicothoracic ganglia or stellate ganglion. So, then you will find only 11 proper thoracic spinal ganglia. Now, let us look at the branches given off by these thoracic sympathetic ganglia. They give lateral branches which are postganglionic and preganglionic fibers. They are the gray rami and white rami communicants which are going to the spinal nerves. They are going to be pseudomotor, pilomotor and vasomotor. They also give medial branches. The upper 1 to 5 thoracic sympathetic ganglia will give medial branches which are postganglionic in nature. They will be going and supplying the lung forming the pulmonary plexus, the heart forming the coronary plexus and the cardiac plexus, aorta forming the aortic plexus and esophagus forming the esophageal plexus. The lower 8 thoracic sympathetic ganglia from T5 to T12, they are going to give medial branches which are carrying preganglionic fibers because the ganglia for the postganglionic fibers will be present very close to the viscera. These branches will get united to form the splanchnic nerves because they are going to supply the viscera. The greater splanchnic nerve will carry fibers from T5 to T9. The lesser splanchnic nerve will carry fibers from T10 and T11 and the least splanchnic nerve will carry fibers from T12. The greater splanchnic nerve carrying T5 to T9 fibers, they will be going to contribute to the cilia ganglion and the aorticorenal ganglion. So, they will form celiac plexus and the aorticorenal plexus. They are also going to contribute to the medulla of the adrenal gland. The lesser splanchnic nerve carrying fibers from T10 and T11, they are going to contribute to the celiac plexus and the aorticorenal ganglia, whereas the least splanchnic nerve, which is also called as renal nerve, is going to supply the kidney. These nerves, the splanchnic nerves will leave the thoracic cage and pass through the crust of the diaphragm. Corresponding crust they can pierce and enter the abdominal cavity. You can see the splanchnic nerve in a dissected specimen. This is the sympathetic trunk whereas this is the splanchnic nerve which is a medial branch a medial branch of the sympathetic trunk. You can see the azygous vein, the thoracic duct and the iota lying closer to the midline and the sympathetic trunk is slightly away from the midline giving off the medial branch that is the splanchnic nerve carrying preganglionic fibers because the ganglia will be very close to the viscera. Coming to the applied anatomy of thoracic sympathetic chain. Thoracoabdominal sympathectomy is a procedure which is done bilaterally excising T5 to L2 sympathetic chain or the trunk along with the splanchnic nerves. This is done in case of severe hypertension, uncontrollable hypertension, then thoracic sympathectomy or thoracoabdominal sympathectomy is the procedure of choice. It should be done bilaterally. To summarize this topic, we looked at the mediastinum and its subdivisions. We looked at the inferior mediastinum, the boundaries, subdivisions and the contents of each part of the mediastinum. We spoke about in detail about the pulmonary trunk, about the esophagus, about the thoracic duct and the azygous venous system and lastly the thoracic sympathetic trunk. We summarize this and end this topic here. Thank you. Now, let us look at the structures in the mediastinum. This is the pulmonary trunk. It is the continuation of the right ventricular infundibulum. So, this is going to continue as the pulmonary trunk and this pulmonary trunk has got a short course. It overlaps the ascending aorta, then it comes to the right side of the ascending, sorry, left side of the ascending aorta and terminates here by dividing into the right and the left branch. The left branch is connected to the arch of aorta by the ligamentum arteriosum. So, this is the pulmonary trunk.
esophagus is another structure which is present in the superior and posterior mediastinum so this is the esophagus in the upper part that is in the superior mediastinum it will be just behind the trachea whereas in the inferior mediastinum it lies on the right side of the descending thoracic aorta initially then it crosses in front of the aorta the two will be connected to each other by a mesoesophagus so this is esophagus and this is aorta the two pleural cavities will be coming closer to each other between the esophagus and the aorta forming the mesoesophagus then the esophagus leaves the thoracic cage by passing through the esophageal opening at what level t10, t10 at the level of t10 so esophageal opening in the diaphragm will allow the passage of the esophagus into the abdomen the last one inch of the esophagus is present inside the abdomen till the cardioesophageal junction so this is the esophagus we can see the sympathetic trunk which is present here on either side of the vertebral column this will give lateral branches which will go along with the intercostal nerves as the white rami and grey rami communicants we can see a medial branch which has been dissected out here this medial branch is the splanchnic nerve if you can recall T5 to T9 will form the greatest splanchnic nerve T10 and T11 will form the lesser splanchnic and T12 will give least splanchnic nerve so this is a splanchnic nerve branch coming from the sympathetic trunk we can see the azygous vein here the unpaired vein that's why it's called as azygous it starts as the lumbar azygous joining with the subcostal and the ascending lumbar vein it enters the thoracic cavity by passing a common opening with the aorta that's the aortic opening at the level of t12 so it lies between the it lies on the right side of the midline medially towards the midline it is related to this structure this is the thoracic duct so thoracic duct lies between the azygous vein and the aorta you can see this azygous vein as it ascends up it will collect all the posterior intercostal veins that will be from the 5th to the 11th posterior intercostal veins all of them drain into the azygous the last tributary for the azygous is this vein which is joining the arch of the azygous this is the superior intercostal vein superior intercostal vein will join the azygous near its arch it is formed by the union of yeah very good second third and the fourth posterior intercostal veins first one will be a tributary to this vein itself what is this brachiocephalic vein so first posterior intercostal vein will end in brachiocephalic vein second third and fourth will join together to form superior intercostal vein on the right side this ends in the arch of the azygous vein whereas on the left side it's going to end in the left brachiocephalic vein itself superior intercostal vein of the left side now you can see these are the posterior intercostal veins this arch of the azygous will arch over the root of the right lung you can see the root structures are cut because the lung has been removed so it arches over the root of the right lung and it's going to come and end in this structure which we have already seen which is this structure superior vena cava before it pierces the fibrous pericardium azygous is going to end in the superior vena cava so that is the azygous vein azygous vein will be united or it will be joined by the hemi azygous veins you can see this tributary which is coming here this is a hemi azygous vein which is going to cross the midline and reach the azygous this will be at the upper and lower borders of t8 the uh, lower border of t8 is the hemi azygous upper border of t8 is the accessory hemi azygous vein so they will join the azygous vein crossing the vertebra behind the aorta and the esophagus so this is hemi azygous venous system so with this we complete the topic of mediastinum